Hi, everyone. My name is Dale. Thank you for listening to the pre-recording of my talk. So one of the underlying themes of this talk is going to be the plasticity first hypothesis. However, what I want to do is first talk about phenotypic plasticity, which is just the basic concept that one genotype can produce multiple phenotypes across environments. And that's shown up here in this first figure of Susan Foster's 2013 animal behavior paper, where she demonstrated that one, or she de shows that one population in environment A displays a different behavioral phenotype than the same population in environment B. The next concept that we should talk about is the, uh, the concept of cryptic genetic variation, which most simply put is the idea that when an environment changes, individuals in the environment are gonna differ in their individual degrees of plasticity. And so what that's gonna result in is a new distribution of phenotypic variation in the population in this new environment. And selection will be able to act on this cryptic genetic variation that's now exposed to adjust the mean of a pop of the new the mean of a population in this new environment. And so this is how we get to the plasticity first hypothesis. Because the hypothesis kind of proposes that when an environment changes, this cryptic genetic variation is released first, and then selection acts to shape the mean phenotype rather than selection acting on the already existing levels of variation. And what that can result in is two different forms of the evolution of phenotypic plasticity. So the first is genetic accommodation, which is uh, usually defined as the change in the slope or elevation of a reaction norm. And so Susan in her 2013 paper depicted that here, where she showed that the um, you know, this derived population here with the white circles has evolved um, a new slope of plasticity while the plasticity is still there. Um, and down here in figure C, we see that it, they've evolved different, eleva different elevations of, of plasticity. So the degree or the slope of the line is the same, but the elevation is different in both cases. You can also get genetic assimilation which is a loss of plasticity altogether, which Susan has depicted in figure B um, in this, with this line here. And the reason I think these concepts are so important is because humans are disrupting and damaging our environment in such a way that we're bringing new suites of ecological and evolutionary challenges to the populations that are experiencing um, our disruptions. And these challenges can interact with the genotype to produce phenotypes um, that would have not been exposed to selection. And so when we think about how human environments are then you know, driving the evolution of populations, they're really doing so or potentially doing so on variations of their variations of phenotypes that they themselves are triggering the release of. And so this makes human disturbed, human disturbed environments ideal testing arenas to test the, the very concept or the very, um, on our, our understanding of the plasticity first hypothesis. And so first I'm gonna talk about an example where a human disturbed, or a form of human disturbance has caused the release of cryptic genetic variation. And that was done so um, in a population of three-spine stickleback, studied by um, Candelin and Jensen and published in 2020. And what they demonstrated um, was this figure here on the right. So this is taken straight from their, their paper. And what you can see here is in the clear environment, the ancestral environment, most of the phenotypic variation in male search activity depicted here on the x-axis exists, exists in this top left quadrant of this figure. So they search at low search activity, um, but that correlates to a high number of inspecting females. However, when the environment changed and became more turbid, what we see is that the variation along this x-axis increased such that you have um, you know, a higher degree, or you have some males that increase their search activity in response to increases in turbidity. Now what's interesting about this is that selection may be acting on this newly expressed variation because you see there's now a correlation here between the search activity of males in turbid environments and the number of inspecting females. And so females are now 
potentially selecting on males with higher search activity, but only in turbid environments when that phenotypic variation is present to begin with. Now that's, that's great, but that's not evidence that phenotypic plasticity or plastic reaction norms are evolving in human disturbed environments. And so now we're gonna talk about an example of thermal plasticity in ants, specifically acorn ants. And what Diamond et al. in 2017 discovered, and so this, these, again, these figures are right from their paper, is that urban and rural environments differ in their critical thermal maximum pictured here on the y-axis of panel A. Um, regardless of their rearing temperature, so on the x-axis, whether they were rearing cool or warm temperatures, urban populations always show higher thermal tolerance. However, what you see here in panel B, what we see in panel B is that urban populations have evolved a higher thermal minimum, meaning that they can't tolerate colder temperatures. However, there's plasticity to their thermal minimum that doesn't exist in the rural population, such that when urban populations of acorn ants are reared in warmer environments, their thermal minimum temperature goes up, meaning that they can tolerate even, they can't tolerate colder temperatures than when they're reared in cool environments. And regardless, they cannot tolerate temperatures as cold as rural populations can. And so the acorn ant example is a great example of evolved plasticity via genetic accommodation. Um, but now we're going to talk about an example of invasive predators and chemical cues, specifically from my dissertation, where I figured, where I found out that fish lose their anti-predator behavioral plasticity following the introduction of an invasive predator. And so I asked if three spine stickleback populations from pike-free and pike-invaded habitats differ in how they behaviorally respond to alarm cues. And what I found was that Pike-free populations, in the closed circles here, show a behavior response to alarm cue, while pike-invaded populations don't. And so that behavioral response has been lost via what we would call genetic assimilation. And what was really interesting about this is that we found that the results are somewhat repeatable. And then if you look at the pike-free populations, you see that they both show the same behavioral response to alarm cues whereas the pike invaded populations either have a very, very weak increase or a decrease in activity, um, which was statistically not significant. And so before we move on, I wanna do just a very brief summary of these three examples. So we've demonstrated that human environments can trigger the release of cryptic genetic variation um, with our stickleback uh, search activity and turbidity example. And we've also demonstrated that the degree of plasticity can evolve both to become greater with the, so a greater degree of plasticity evolved in thermal acorn ants or in acorn ants thermal tolerance, in this case, um, thermal minimums, or behavioral plasticity can be lost through um, genetic assimilation and um, stickleback populations. However, the responses aren't always as clear cut. So Diamond et al. in 2018 looked for parallel results of evolved thermal tolerance and thermal minimums um, in acorn ants across three cities and could not find any consistent results among them. And I also tried to look for even more consistency in behavioral responses in stickleback in response to northern pike invasion. And so this time, rather than manipulate chemical cues, I manipulated predator exposure directly. So I took a, a model northern pike, um, measured their behavior, measured stickleback behavior for five minutes, attacked them with the model pike, and then measured their behavior again, and looked to see if the actual behavioral responses of these populations had evolved consistently there as well. And what I found was that wasn't quite the case. If anything, the only characteristic of pike invaded populations is that there's a higher degree of among population level variance. And so one, you know, one could say, well, your chemical Q results were consistent. Maybe that's just the environment where, or that's just the selection of pressure where they evolve consistent responses. However, if we take a look at this figure that I showed you earlier, 
the two populations, the two pike invaded populations pictured here on the um, chemical Q figure, happen to be these same two figure or same two populations. And so it might not be that they evolved consistent responses. It's that I picked two populations that tend to be or that are behaviorally similar to each other, um, and may not represent the entire group of populations. Um, that are invaded by northern pike. And so the, the consistency and the repeatability of these results are being questioned by the um, results I have in this chapter of my dissertation. And so that really brings us to kind of the, the take home message of this talk. And which is I, I think, um, you know, like the title says, it's it's embracing complexity. And so this wouldn't be animal behavior if I didn't talk about behavior itself specifically. And it's, you know, I really think that moving forward, behavior is the ideal phenotype to address, you know, how animals are evolving in response to human disturbance. And the reason I think that is that behavior shows a very unique type of behavioral plasticity um, and that it can display plasticity in two different contexts, or if you'd rather think of it as a continuum of plasticity, that works also. Uh, mainly that you know, behavioral plasticity can take the form of changes or, you know, responses to immediate changes in an organism's environment. So being attacked by a predator, being suddenly exposed to alarm cues, but can also be shaped by other factors such as developmental plasticity. And so these two forces or these two kind of concepts um, interact to, to shape behavior overall. And this complexity, given the suite of changes novel environments, specifically human disturbed ones, bring may shape phenotypes in a really complex way. And I think there's a great example in snails that demonstrate this. And so this paper, um, authors and pub, uh, title are down here if you're interested. This is a figure straight from the paper. And so what the authors did was they looked at um, activational plasticity in response to a control or predator cues. And so you can see immediate environment is here on the x-axis. And so then they expose, um, or these, these snails were reared from a couple different lineages. And so they are pictured here um, near each reaction norm. So each C and each P represents the rearing environment and the, their parents' rearing environment. And so the parents were reared in either a control environment or those with predation cues. And then the organisms themselves were reared in environments with um, control cues or predation cues. And so you get a four by four design here. And what we can see is that individual or activational plasticity is shaped by both parental effects and developmental plasticity. And so if all of these forms of plasticity are interacting to shape behavior and each population of animals may differ slightly in their ability to evolve plasticity along all three of these examples, it's not necessarily surprising and we may not be getting consistent results among populations because we're not really manipulating the environment in the lab in ways that really let us expose the variation that may exist in these phenotypes. And so studies moving forward should really try to emphasize how individual plasticity or activational plasticity, developmental plasticity, and parental effects or other forms of, of plasticity really all interact to shape behavior and in populations that differ in their evolutionary history, if we're really going to understand how organisms are adapting in response to human disturbance. And while I didn't have time to really talk about it tonight, multidimensional plasticity is another um, future direction where I see a lot of promise in, because phenotypes, activity, um, escape behaviors, mate choice, whatever your behavior of interest is, is likely going to be responding to not only one cue but multiple cues. So the presence of pesticides, whether or not you, uh, your parents were, you know, reared in an environment with pesticides, how hot the water is, how arid the, or dry the environment is, may all interact to shape behavior. And since human disturbed environments bring a whole suite of uh, novel changes, without 
accurately manipulating all of those different variables, or at least a few of them, we may not really know how behavior is evolving without doing so, or without accounting for that plasticity. And I have a, a lot of people I need to, to thank for this. So first and foremost, I need to thank Susan Foster and John Baker. Five years ago, I wasn't sure if I was gonna get into a graduate program, let alone succeed. And they really presented me with an environment that allowed me to prosper and to do well. And here I am five years later, um, a year away from graduating. And so I am infinitely grateful to everything that they've ever done for me. I also need to equally thank my co-authors, Matthew One and, and Caitlin Mathis. When John and Susan were first diagnosed with cancer and were spending a lot of time um, tending to their health, Matt and Kate made sure that I, I wasn't alone, that I had someone to bounce ideas off of. They've helped me publish my manuscripts, and I really wouldn't be here without the two of them. I also need to thank my dissertation committee, Philip Bergman and Nava Meyer. Um, they've also really stepped up to help me and have made sure that I've gotten everything I've needed. And I also need to thank uh, two former lab members, specifically Melissa Graham and Christina Bargis for their help with these projects. These are the ones about my dissertation that I present, or in my dissertation that I presented today. Um, they were instrumental in helping me collect the data, formulate ideas. And, you know, I wouldn't be here without them. And I also need to thank the undergraduates, Quincy Milton, Sadie O'Neill, Nicole Minghella, or Mingella, and Emily Michaelfelder. Um, they've helped me collect numerous data and analyze numerous behavior videos, and without them, I would not be graduating. Um, thank you.